Strange as it may seem, but in the United States such a business was not considered something very improper. Moreover, in the States they even published special guides to the brothels, in which anyone could choose a club for themselves in accordance with their money and the level of service. You're watching Flip Side of History, and today we will tell you about what life was like for a brothel worker in the 19th century in the USA. Let's begin. The lives of the women workers themselves differed according to the class to which they belonged. If we take the San Francisco classification, the lowest level was the so-called manger, the place of work of such girls were cages constructed in the manner of a horse manger, in which women received their clients. On the same level were girls, whose clients were chosen by special people. In New York, this was an analog of the so-called street love. There was also a variant of public love, which was exhibited to attract clients in entertainment establishments of a dubious nature. The next level was the dance halls. For instance, waitress girls who handed out drinks in lounges and could excite even a stone would interest customers, then withdraw with them in separate rooms. Here the client was bound to know the absence of panels behind which his accomplices could hide. But the drunk client often fell into the trap of the women's charms and ended up being robbed as well. This was an extra charge for these services. The analog of dance halls was the so-called theater love, a feature unique to America. Girls found clients in the theaters and indulged in the pleasures on the third tier. And finally, the highest levels were the salons run by madams. This was already considered a light in the market of service provision, and clients there were quite wealthy and respectable citizens. In terms of the American brothels, they could be basically divided into capital brothels and indecent brothels. The first were in big cities, such as New York. The second were typical of cities like San Francisco, which flourished after the gold rush, silver rush, and so on. Therefore, the typical working day of the ladies of love differed dramatically depending on the place of work. Well, street girls. One day of such workers was not much different from another. Walking down the streets, a girl would find a client, with whom, as a rule, further negotiations were conducted by a pimp. Then privacy and not always in a room, often the services took place directly on the street, in some dark corner. After the process was completed, the pimp received payment and the girl went out again to find clients. The ladies of love who worked in theaters were of a higher class, so the level of prices and the quality of services were, by virtue of default, much higher. Although many historians assert that the girls themselves offered their services to theater visitors, this is hardly possible. We must not forget that there were moral requirements, after all, and a girl's talk of an obviously certain kind of occupation could cast a shadow on the image of a good and respectable American. It is true, though, that the pimps were respectable looking, so there were no particular problems. Sometimes the theatrical brothels were disguised as rather flirtatious productions, after which the customers, inflamed by what they had seen, would go to bed with the hotties they liked. Finally, the girls of the brothels themselves, which were run by madams, were in the foremost privileged position. First of all, it was always the madam who dealt with the customers. Secondly, the staff necessarily included either a formidable-looking knocker or somewhere nearby hung a fostered police officer. Therefore, any questions concerning inadequate customers or scandals in ETC were dealt with quickly and with great severity. As a matter of fact, the working day of these girls was not one of regular customer service. The girls sat at the bar where customers, who were in the mood for gambling and horse racing, came to relax. They could carry on conversations for up to several hours while drinking wine and making light-hearted chats. The men, well aware of who they were talking to and for what purpose, were always respectful of their female companions. This is a specific American peculiarity of the century before last, a respectful attitude toward the fair gender. The main advantage of brothels was that in addition to the purely sexual, clients also received an emotional discharge, which was also needed. Therefore, it is not surprising that the rates in such establishments were quite high. For comparison, the most expensive white American woman of the manger or dance hall level was about a dollar, and the services of allied brothel workers were estimated at five dollars, and sometimes this amount was up to thirty bucks, which was actually quite expensive delight. After providing services, the girls would go back to their new clients and then go to rest. Any self-respecting lady carefully watched the health of her staff, so periodically the girls visited doctors instead of working hours. Brothels in San Francisco This type of brothel, characteristic also of the city of Vice of New Orleans, was fundamentally different from the brothels of the level of New York, and paid love itself had a very different flavor here. The fact is that the gold rush, followed by the silver rush, had brought tens of thousands of men to California, dreaming of getting rich. 
The miners toiled in the mines until the beginning of winter and then returned to San Francisco for a period of cold weather. And here was a fairly surprising situation. The ratio of men to women at the most intense moment was 6,000 to 1. Therefore, the terrible shortage of the feminine gender led to a surge of needs of a certain nature and even the importation of sex slaves from abroad. As a rule, the girls were imported from China. Therefore, amid the huge deficit of female affection, the number of brothels in the city was not just huge, but unbelievably huge. There were even equivalents of modern shopping malls, in which each brothel was distinguished by the list of services and the type of service personnel. Many historians have ironically stated that long before the creation of the United Nations, equality of people regardless of color and nationality appeared in the brothels of San Francisco, which did not compete with each other and did not cause conflict similar to those between nationalities and ethnic groups. The working day of the girls of the lower level of the manger in the city was like insanely hard and exhausting work. Clients entered the manger without much regard or concern for their partners. In fact, the girls were constantly being used and they did not get a chance to rest until early in the morning when the number of clients was gone. In the same category were not really prostitutes but call girls. In one salon, for example, customers came in to watch a woman in a huge stud capillate. In fact, the atmosphere in San Francisco's marketplace of corrupt love and dubious amusements was such that one historian compared it to literal hell on earth. <laughs> Scoundrels of all ethnic origins have set up here an incessant carnival. It is a vast theater where glittering stilettos, hunting knives, lethal drugs and daring naval revolvers are the indispensable attributes of a terrible play that goes on continuously on this stage. Promiscuity, immorality, Drunkenness, gluttony, filth, simply disgusting diseases, crazy affairs, poverty and wealth, blasphemy, godlessness and death are all here. Hell itself, unleashed at our feet, is here celebrating its dinner. The peculiarity of San Francisco was that even respectable brothels were nothing like New York brothels, with their leisurely conversations and booze. Even the most respectable establishments always had lines of 40 or 50 people. There was no time for conversation, so the girls worked like hounds, having just a few minutes to catch their breath. Of course, the elite ladies, who were fabulously expensive, accepted upper-class clients and they didn't have to act as a satisfaction machine. Most valued were either young or very beautiful girls, and the most expensive favor was the love of a red-haired gorgeous girl. Even more expensive was a red-haired Jewish girl. It is not clear what this had to do with it, but it is safe to say that in those conditions of total deficiency of women, only a handful could demand relatively acceptable and normal working conditions for themselves. In the second half of the 19th century, various women's committees and religious ministers launched a crusade against the sale of love. By that time, the shortage of women had also gradually disappeared, so even in the brothels of San Francisco, the working day of the hard workers began to differ very little from their colleagues in reputable New York City. Thank you for watching this video. Subscribe to Flip Side of History and leave a like.